Hi, I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We run a wildlife education nonprofit focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day around the country. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management and ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. Join us each week to discover just how these dedicated people are working to protect our planet. Alrighty guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We are here at Grace Marine Lab working with their research experience for undergraduates program. So we've got a lot of really cool projects happening here in Charleston this summer. So we're here with Tamara, Aubrey, and Christian, and we're really excited to hear what you guys are doing. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So let's just dive right on in here. Um, and I'm going to have each of you guys go around and give me just like a 10 second snapshot of what you're studying this summer, starting with Tamara. Okay. Hey, I'm Tamara and I am studying the effects of the Eastern mud snail as well as their effects on benthic microalgae communities. All right. I'm Aubrey and I'm studying the impact of increasing salinity on amphibian and random predator ecology balance and how increasing salt impacts how they interact with each other. Hey guys, it's Christian here and I am looking at puncture resistance of moray and shark skin. Wow, that's <laughs> interesting. So let's start there. Why? Yeah, why? Give me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty much I love marine animals and this project is the culmination of me as a child, always poking through plastic bags. I don't know why, but as a child, you have a plastic bag in your hand. You just have the sensation to poke your finger through it. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, why not do that with more eel skin and shark skin? Absolutely. So what is what is a question that you're trying to answer with your study? So pretty much we're trying to find out which predator, a uh, shark or more eel, is the most effective in biting and puncturing skin. Okay. As a proxy for like how they interact with each other or how they compete with each other for resources in the environment. Right. So both shark and moray eels are two predators of coral reef environments. And so when they both want to eat the same thing, they tend to fight over it because they don't like to share their food. So they are going to try and bite each other and get each other away. And it's pretty good to be a good fighter under the sea. Like, really, this is who would win in a fight, right? That's yeah. What this, yeah, that's what I thought. That's the great. unofficial name for my research is the Bite Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> Love nice. it. Yeah, that's excellent. And, you know, that's the difference between messing around and science is writing it down, right, and having good experimental design. So this is a really cool example of, like, here's a question I want to know the answer to. Let's find out. So what can you tell me a little bit about what your experimental design is and how you're collecting your data. Yeah, like I'm assuming you don't have a shark and an eel and like you just watch them fight throughout the day. Round one, go. You know, as cool as that would be, <laughs> um, no. So we don't have live specimens. Pretty much we have um, sample specimens or dead animals um, of shark and more eels that we then take skin samples from. And we use a puncture machine pretty much that has a probe on the end so it's a pointy metal object that lowers down over the skin to see how much force or strength it takes to puncture through the skin but we also are using actual teeth from each animal to puncture the skin so mori skin is going to be punctured with the shark's tooth and shark skin is going to be punctured with the mori eel tooth did you ever consider looking at intraspecies interaction where you have moray teeth biting into moray skin and vice versa? So we have thought about that, but we wanted to focus more so on the shark and moray eel interaction instead of the moray versus moray and shark versus shark. Makes sense. There's a lot of types of sharks. What species of sharks are you working with specifically? Yeah, so we are working with the Atlantic sharp nose shark, which is really common here in Charleston. Um, the scientific name is Rhizoprionodon terranovae. I know that's a mouthful. Nailed nice. it. <laughs> and then for the mores, we have 
two types. We have the spotted moray, which is Gymnothorax moringa, and the purple mouth moray, which is Gymnothorax vicinus. Okay, so pretty similar species. Is there a significant difference between those two types of moray eels? Um, besides the coloration um, on the skin, they are actually fairly similar. And they actually also reside within the same area range from the Caribbean to Florida, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, excellent. So we're going we're gonna to roll around to results a little bit later. But um, <laughs> we've got some other really cool projects in the broom. Only slightly smaller snails. So Tamara, what made you want to study snails? Um, that's a good question. So um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys have known of the famous little adorable snail pet that Spongebob has. So Gary, of course. Of course. Um, I actually love uh, watching Spongebob, so that I love doing that. But also, I do love the environment. And even though I'm not a marine bio uh, major at the College of Charleston, I did want to get into some type of research. And I was like, what better idea than doing it with snails? So what I'm doing is I'm studying these eastern mud snails and their effects on benthic microalgae communities. So uh, one thing that's really important out there is the mud. You're probably just like, What's so important about mud, you know, other than that you used to play in it as a kid or, you know, it gets your shoes really dirty. But the mud is very sustainable because it helps to provide stability to the sediment out there so that plants can grow. But also it houses these type of microalgae, which is like really small algae that are they're not really green in color, but they can be um, adverse with different colors. And they pretty much make their own food, but also provide nutrients for other animals. So what we're trying to see is that these snails are tending to eat the mud and along with it, the microalgae. We wanna see how that is affecting the mud out there in the pluff mud, but also is it causing different diversity? Is it causing different microalgaes to be more predominant or one to be less adverse out there? So hopefully we can figure that out. So really it's a lot of baseline, just like in what ways are the snails changing the algae that is prevalent or not prevalent in an area. Absolutely. So it really boils down to like, what are the habits of the snails? And what are the conditions that the microalgaes thrive or don't thrive in? And, you know, what is the data? What's it showing, right? So what does your data collection look like? Are you out there like with a um, magnifying glass, like following snails or what are you doing? Well, that is a good question, and I'm happy to answer it. So every day I go out, as you know, Charleston is very hot and humid. Um, so I'm just out there, athletic clothing, big sun hat, bucket hat sometimes. And <laughs> if I can help it, I hope I don't have on my glasses because then they get covered in mud. Yes. But um, I have to cross a creek every day. So I like to tell my friends, hey, I've got to go catch the tide because um, you don't want to be out there in the creek um, and get washed away. So I cross this creek and the pluff mud is huge out there. Like it's just, it goes on for miles and miles. And then you have the nice marsh over there. And you would think that since these snails are so small, you wouldn't be able to see them. Absolutely not. They're all there. They're just hanging out. They're having a party. So <laughs> uh, one thing that we like to say out there is that you want to avoid the quagmire of death. And for, for people that don't know what pluff mud is, it's pretty much uh, a different version of mud, but it acts more like quicksand. So when you're going out there, you could think that you're just walking and you could be just fine. And one second, your half of your waist is in the mud. And I'm a tall person. I'm 5'11". <laughs> so for me to sink halfway in, that's kind of scary. That's some deep mud. That's some deep mud. I mean, um, sometimes you have to army crawl out there. But for our data collection, what we're looking at is we're doing a 60 meter transect and we're cutting that into 10 even blocks where we'll have our three treatments. So we're looking at inclusion, exclusion, as well as ambient. Uh, ambient is to simulate just a natural environment where the snails would just thrive in the pluff mud. Within these cages, we want to see how are they affecting the benthic microalgae? Uh, is it causing more chlorophyll A to be produced? What's the diversity in there? Um, also, are they affecting the erosion effects in there with the snails moving around, but also them consuming the mud? So there is a lot that goes into being out there. You do get a workout. So every time I go out there, I don't have to do leg day. There you go. <laughs> um, leg day every day. Leg day every day. So it is very fun. Um, and I just love coming back over to the beach. And you just see people on the weekend and they're out there having fun on their boats. And they're just like, oh, my gosh, 
who is that? And their kids just run away because they think that I'm like a mud monster. <laughs> yeah, so that swamp monster from the death. Yes. <laughs> and I'm just like, hey guys, I'm just coming back. And I just I'm just love, a scientist. I'm hair just, flip. I'm just a scientist. <laughs> Let me just flip my hair with my muddy hands. Right, you know? right. And then I just get to tell them about all that I'm doing. And it's very exciting. That's awesome. Have people like, really come up to you like regularly just like, what are you doing? I do. They do think that I'm out there looking for clams or oysters, uh, which is something that you wouldn't think is over there in the mud. But I do have some battle scars uh, from that would me. disagree with that. <laughs> that they would disagree. Are there. They are there. Um, but I absolutely love it, and my skin is pretty soft. <laughs> I believe it. Puff mud's good for your skin. It really is. So if I understand it right, you've got you're basically laying out that you said it was 60 meters. 60 meters. So yes. you've got this line that's 60 meters long. And in that, you've got three sections. One that is just all natural. It's how it would be out in the world. One section has a cage around it that keeps snails out. Mm -hmm. And one has a cage around it that keeps snails in. Absolutely. That's correct. And you're looking at how, under these three conditions, the algae is different over time. Yes, sir. Perfect. Cool. So how did you pick the unlucky snails that get to live in the inclusion zone? <laughs> that took a long time, to be honest. Um, I went out there with a little transect meter, um, and we randomly kind of did a random number generator to figure out where out there in the pluff mud over that 60-meter transect, um, not exactly on it, but how many snails would reside within this type of area in order for us to figure out how many snails would actually be within these cages, uh, exclusively the inclusion ones. So we counted those snails and it was over a thousand <laughs> so it was a lot and then uh, we kind of did the math on that and we went to do it was about 200 but just to kind of like round it down a little bit because they do like to burrow within the mud we did it to about 190 to kind of give that plus or minus so it was a lot of counting snails that one day I think I was out there maybe three hours counting snails for 10 different blocks for 10 different replicates. So it was a lot. Um, a, that is a lot of snail counts. Don't worry. <laughs> I did lose track and have to start over. Oh, so no. okay. <laughs> I feel like I remember that day where you came in, like we were doing um, a workshop for science communication and you came in and everyone was like, are you okay? You're like snails. <laughs> There's so many snails. <laughs> They're in so the mud. <laughs> They're, you know, snails on the brain. You it's know? like a snails nightmare. You're going to have a phobia <laughs> of like escargot now. I am. Right? Like I'm just... Everyone's like, oh, snails? Like, can I eat them? I was like, hey, I mean, if you want to, there's several out there. Like, there's You can go find them. Go find them. Yeah. All right. I want to, we're going to dive deeper into that. But. Wait, yeah. I have just a quick question. You said you're not a marine bio major, but it sounds a lot like marine biology. So what is your major? My major is just biology. Um, I'm actually a double major. I'm biology and psychology. So nice. I thought that that was kind of interesting. I was so glad to have the opportunity because I didn't think that I was fit for this program just because I didn't have that background. But just from being here and having amazing peers, but also mentors that really want to help you is really great. And I've learned so many skills. I'm both in the field, but also in the lab. So just getting that experience, it has been such a blessing to me. And I really do love marine bio. I wish I could just keep going with it. Um, but hopefully I can tap into that further within my career. Definitely. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> and Aubrey, I saw some realization when uh, she was talking about pluff mud. You seem like you've had a lot of experiences with that. I don't know if that's necessarily part of your research, but I want to I want to hear about some of that look that I got. So it's not part of my research. I'm originally from East St. Louis, Illinois, landlocked state moved to the low country about like seven years ago and like the month leading up to my move here was just pluff mud pluff mud pluff mud i'm like okay, what's going on and so i was like asking family down here and like doing google searches like what is pluff mud and it was like horror stories so of people like falling off their bike and i was like what is pluff mud and then i get to go out in it and it's, it is like quicksand but your skin is so soft so it's like, it's, like weird <laughs> like it's like this weird just like symbolism just like swamp and it's so funny because you made the point, um, Tamara, that like it's like really sustainable and mud's really stable and X, Y, and Z. I was like, my pluff, my mud is not. So for my research, I got in the swamp and I've literally almost fallen over like eight times. And with my hair, I'm just like, no, not the duckweed. Anything but the duckweed. It's never going to come out. I've already lost like three boots. And it's, I had to explain to my mentor like why I'm like losing boots on a steady rate more than I'm finding anything for the first like two weeks. And she's like, you're going through funding pretty quickly just in these boots. And I was like, they're nice boots. What can I say? 
<laughs> um, I don't choose this life. You need like waders or something, so your yeah. boot is just attached to like the rest of the outfit. And that's what they're so they're technically waders, but they come up to your like thigh. So I feel like I'm like SpongeBob from like keeping with SpongeBob with like the squeaky boots. Squeaky I feel boots. like I have squeaky <laughs> boots. I had to walk through um, the Rita Halling Center, which is like one of the main science locations and buildings on campus for CFC. And people could hear me coming because the waiters yes. are squeak, but they don't have like the overall ones to see on like the shows like Deadliest Catch or anywhere or something like that. So I lose them really easily. Um, and, <laughs> and it's not Plus, mud's not forgiving. It's not like, oh, no, you can keep your shoes this time. It's no. like any opportunity. It's you're gonna lose neither your is the swamp, Definitely apparently. Gone. No, it's not. And so I'm actually conducting my research in Freshwater Ponds at Stunnel Preserve, which is a satellite campus of sorts um, about 30, 40 minutes from main campus, downtown Charleston. But it's right along the Stono River. And so a lot of the mud there is essentially pluff mud, but just fresh water, which is, I don't, Charles would know what the mud is, but I don't know what the mud is, right? Like what the actual term for that kind of mud is, but it is mean. It's the spiciest <laughs> mud, if you will. It <laughs> loves taking boots. Mud. Loves taking my boots. So tell me about what exactly you're looking at. I know that we've talked about like saltwater intrusion, and we've talked about bugs, and we've talked about tadpoles, and I want to know how all these things fit together. So I'm a big fan of ecology and animal behavior and studying how the changing environment impacts how an animal interacts with other organisms and also their environment directly. So I'm looking into how increasing salinity and salinization, which is just salt in saltier water, getting into fresh environments. I'm just looking at how being in a saltier environment impacts animals that are really sensitive to those kind of changes. So tadpoles are what we would call a canary in the coal mine, a keystone species that are and a keystone species is a species that really represents the health of the environment. And tadpoles, or amphibians in general, don't like salt. Generally speaking, they hate it. They really can't survive much of a fluctuation in salt levels. So I am taking groups of tadpoles, typically about five tadpoles, and putting them in these containers of various salinity. So I have a group that's at um, four PPT, and PPT stands for parts per thousand, which is just the ratio of water to salt. I have some at 4 PPT, 8, 6, 12, and 10. And for reference, ocean water is about 32, right? Yes. And fresh water would be zero. Yes. So it's not we're not talking like ocean level salinity, but definitely saltier than a freshwater pond would be ordinarily. Definitely. You yeah, you're not not even close to salt water. It, we had a joke that like you would know if it's salt water if you like a fall, frog like jumped in and jumped right back out because they just cannot stand it. But so my tadpoles stay in this water for about six days. And then I also have a rotating cast of different invertebrates specifically because those are the predators that eat tadpoles the most in low country, ponds, rivers, freshwater environments. So right now I'm working with what are called water tigers. And those are larvae of beetles, beetles that dive down and eat tadpoles, small fish, things like that. I call them spicy worms because they <laughs> look like worms with six little legs, and then they have the head of an ant, and they bite pretty much everything. They bit my gloves. They bit my, like, little stirring rods that I feed them with. They bite everything. And then I have dragonfly nymphs. So for anyone that might not know, dragonflies actually start off as these, like, weird, like, super ants. They kind of – they have, like, the dragonfly head on the body of an ant. These and big bendy legs, and they crawl around. Yeah, I call like, them nightmare fuel because they just look they, they look like the monsters from Alien vs. Predators. Yeah, um, they're they, creepy. They are, and they can throw their jaws out like two times the length of their body and grab stuff and bring it back. Um, so I'm using those as well. That's it, terrifying. It, <laughs> it was terrifying to find the first one because I didn't know what I was looking for. My mentor went out with me and she was like, okay, here's a picture of what we're looking for. And I was like, okay, like I get the idea. And then I got one and it was like the size of my thumb. And I was like, this will not be this big. <laughs> I, I don't like this. Um, and I've been going out for so long. I just found some, which is awesome. And then I was like, I have to feed these things. And they eat just over just at least two tadpoles a day. I mean, that's their job, right? At that life stage is to just gather as much nutrients as they can so that they can become their adult forms exactly right? there is like you remember the book the hungry hungry caterpillar like that but terrifying yeah that's pretty much what it is and then my final predator group is water bugs it's different than water beetles it's just like a taxonomic thing but they essentially have they have six legs the back four are like paddles and they dive really well um the front ones are these arms that bend forward and have like two little like pinchers like crabs almost and they essentially grab whatever swims past them and gives it a really tight hug. And then they take this like needle-like mouth and they inject stomach 
juices into, let's say, a tadpole and turn it into a tadpole Capri Sun, and they just drink it, Woof. which is, yeah. I had that. That was how it was explained to me, and I was like, I really don't want to find these things. Like, I don't want to work with these. These are no. terrifying. Yeah. So I take all of that, and I put them in different kinds of water, and then I let them interact with one, one another and see how that impacts how they behave. Because typically, all these predators will eat one to two tadpoles a day, and I'm expecting to see that level decrease, but I'm depending on if they're working with tadpoles that have only been in fresh water or tadpoles that have been in salt water. So I'm expecting anything from fresh water to perform at higher levels than those that would be in salt water. So the basic idea is that salt water is not good for these amphibians. And if they're exposed to it, they will be less healthy and less able to escape predators. Exactly. So why actually two questions. The first question is what is the issue with saltwater intrusion? Why is it happening? Where is it coming from? Why is this a new thing that, that amphibians are having to deal with nowadays? It isn't necessarily, from my understanding of everything going on, it's definitely a complex or what we would call a wicked issue, something that has more than one contributor, more than one side to it. You can't just isolate one cause. Um, in the low country, we experience tons of hurricanes and just storms. And from very different means and different sources, these storms are becoming, as anyone here on the coast can attest to, more and more volatile and just stronger. And so you're seeing more storm surge and more water getting in these freshwater ponds and waterways that typically don't have that. But it's not something new. We're just seeing more of it. Same thing in other areas of just like weather and climatology. We're seeing more of it just given a lot of things. So it's intensifying. It's, there yes, has always been the occasional saltwater intrusion, yes. but it's happening more frequently and in larger doses because of just climate change in general causing larger storms. Exactly. And then it also happens in inland. So I'm originally from Illinois. We get a lot of ice and snow. We use um, salt on the roads to clear the roads. A lot of that salt makes its way into waterways, aquifers, things like that. So even different amphibians that have zero exposure to salt are getting salt now because we are using it so heavily going out to climate change. You're seeing more snow, more ice, things like that. More salt, more salt, more salt. And now that's going in the waterways. The reason it matters is because, like I mentioned earlier, amphibians are keystone species. Whether you realize it or not, not everyone like chase frogs in their kids. Not everyone eats frog legs. I talked to a little kid earlier, and he was like, I hate frogs. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, I love them. I work with them every day. But culturally, they're pretty important. And they also represent, as I was saying, keystone species. They represent the health of an environment. Here in the low country, we... I mean, there's food based around the swamp. There's some spiritual ceremonies and just recreational practices and just like going boating, going swimming, playing with snails in the mud, things like that. They're really important. And environmentally, these marshes and swamps are where a lot of juvenile, so um, dragonfly larvae, tadpoles, juvenile fish, sharks, even marine mammals like dolphins and manatees really rely on marshes. And brackish water is what you would call water that's not super salty, kind of a little fresh, kind of in between. They will rely on these areas to be brackets instead of salty. And so it's kind of a, these are nurseries for various kinds of animals, both marshes and swamps. And if we can understand how increasing levels of salt is hurting or impacting amphibians, we can kind of be a little ahead of the curve to see how other animals are going to be impacted and hopefully learn from that. Because they're so sensitive, because of the permeable skin, which just means that they absorb things through their skin, they're a great way to see where everything's at. So from a scientific point of view, I'm doing this because I want to help everyone understand, okay, this is where we're at. It could get a lot worse. We could have a shift in population levels because predators are eating amphibians faster. We don't have any more frogs. We don't have any more toads, things like that. Which represents a huge amount of nutrient exchange, right? So frogs yeah, are concentrating nutrients from various sources into the waterways. Mm -hmm. They represent a, a major link between multiple environments. Definitely. And so the loss of that population could really throw off the chemical cycling that everything around it has evolved to be used to. Amphibians are essentially tadpoles. I right, love referring to them as the chicken nuggets of the swamp. <laughs> everything eats them. You're spot on. Everything. And so we would be kind of disappointed if McDonald's to stop selling chicken nuggets. If we couldn't get chicken nuggets anywhere else. It'd be Kind of disappointing. I like chicken. Like, it's good. So It'd be rough. It would be, be, be a hard it, life. It'd be a hard it life. would be a hard life. I love chicken nuggets, so I'm right there with you. So have you found an answer yet? Have you seen how the saltwater, like how the salinity affects these tadpoles, or are we not there yet? 
It's been a long journey. We're still working on it right now. Interestingly enough, I have found that the predators, at least in my case, the invertebrates I'm working with, are actually more sensitive than the species of amphibians I started working with, which is Hylus monero, more commonly known as just green tree frogs. Those are everywhere. That's what was on my shoe the other day, Sarah Catherine. Have a great and video. I didn't step on him. Sorry, that sounded like I stepped on him. No, he jumped onto <laughs> my shoe. Oh, no, they have no fear of people. Like, they will, they, <laughs> that where I live right now, they love just to, like, after it rains, hang out around, like, a porch light and just grab all the bugs. It's a hilarious. buffet, man. But the minute you open the door to go out or go in, they're going right in there. Like, they're fearless. Oh, yeah. So they actually have been shown to, they respond like other amphibians in a lot of ways to salinity, but they have a higher tolerance. So where grass is located right on the water, and I'm looking at a window right now at all the seagrass and just the marsh itself, you can find them out there, which is insane because they're right on salt water. They have no issue with that. So they're actually doing better than I expected and doing a lot better than the predators. However, my mentor found a clutch of eggs, like mystery eggs. It's been really fun. It's like one of the highlights of my summer this far. And so we've had this like mystery tub of tadpoles and we have no idea what they are but we know they're ronidae which is a family of basically it's the same family it's they're referred to as true frogs and so we think they're pig frogs or brawn frogs which are closer cousins than the green tree frogs to bullfrogs and so those are not liking salt water at all so i haven't found anything conclusive other than green tree frogs are just built different they really don't mind the salt water which is surprising and the ronidae are really sensitive and those are the ones you get more like further inland so i'm surprised we even found any does that answer your question yes it does thank you so aubrey you say that the green tree frogs like they're out here near the marsh Um, i know that's like the focus of your project is more of on salinity so would you say that they're more adapting to these type of environments or are they just pretty much like you say built different it's hard to say they're adapting to it because it would i mean they would have had been doing this for so much longer than the occurrence of just like increasing freshwater salinization would have been going on like it's not unfortunately like recent but i don't think they're adapting to it i think they've just had that change and i don't think we really know why um, it's kind of hard to like break down a frog's physiology to be like, okay, what specifically is making you love salt water? Dr. Welch has actually done a study at the other side of Grice. So you put out these three different tubs of water, and each one, the ones I had was like 0.4 PPT, one was like six, and the other was like 12. And they've laid eggs indiscriminately. Didn't it matter to them? Which signals that like they've been programmed after generations to just ignore it, which sucks for the tap holes because they don't know that yet. So I think that there's something about the physiology of an adult green tree frog that just eats salt up. They just don't mind it. And I personally don't have any idea what that is yet. That's fascinating. I am a herpetologist by background. It's what I did in my undergraduate. This is the first time I'm hearing that hylidae. In, is it hylidae in general or is it only green tree frogs? Right you know? now, I think it's hylus okay. Um I Green tree frogs. That's the only thing I've found. Okay. Um, I would love to get my hands on some other members of the Hyla family just to work with them. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's the first time I've, I've heard of it. That's something that I would like to learn more about. Maybe we'll do a whole podcast on that. So speaking about results, I want to come back to who would win in the <laughs> Bite Fight Club. Yeah, so what do we think? Where are we at right now with your research? I, I know that we're several weeks into the program and we're only a few weeks from being done. So with your research, Christian, kind of what are the preliminary results that you're finding right now? Yeah, so fortunately, I have concluded, for now, the puncture data. Um, So just taking the skin samples from these moray eels and these sharks and poking them with this metal probe as well as the teeth. And we've found that the moray skin, because it is so stretchy, it has a lot of elastin in it, it is able to withstand higher force levels before it's punctured. Whereas shark skin, on the other hand, does not stretch that well. So it is taut, pretty much. And when it is punctured, it doesn't take that much force or distance to essentially poke through. That's fascinating because it is very different skin, right? So moray eels rely a lot on like mucus to provide an extra layer between the inside of their bodies and the outside of their bodies, where sharks go a whole completely different direction with osteoderms, which is why shark skin is rough, right? So they've got literally tiny teeth 
covering their bodies, which are little armored plates that, one, help them swim more efficiently through the water. It helps shed the water over their skin. But two, it's great protection because when you're a big predator, you need good protection. It's very interesting. If you had asked me who I thought had better puncture resistance at the beginning of this, I would 100% have said sharks because of the way that they're armored. Definitely me too. Right? But the, the idea that the elasticity of it allows eel skin to recover better, you know, or, or not fail catastrophically at higher pressures is very interesting. Yeah, that's literally exactly it. You know, eels are like the sneaky warriors no one thought, the underdogs <laughs> that everyone was like betting against. Which, to be fair, thinking about like eels as a whole, not to anthropomorphize eels, but they, you know, they're, they're like in and out of holes. They've got to be like, they travel through very diverse environments and they have to be prepared for like all sorts of contingencies. So it kind of, I kind of, it's kind of fitting that they've got like the stretchier, like sly kind of skin. Yeah. As opposed to the sharks that are just like sort of out there and heavily armored. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, like eels are so, they are the closest thing to hagfish that exists. And if anyone knows about hagfish, hagfish are super slimy. Like you can take some hagfish slime, put it in water, and the entire bucket would be slime. If you're listening to this right now, you need to pause this podcast. You need to go to YouTube and search like hagfish bucket slime and see what comes up because hagfish are amazing at their ability to create this defensive slime. Yeah. So eels essentially, to a lesser degree, use that same slime to resist friction from when a tooth comes in contact with its skin. And it also is super stretchy to a lesser degree of hagfish. So that way, the tooth has to dry further into the skin before it can poke through. So what is the implication in all of this when it comes to predator-predator interactions on the reef? Yeah, so essentially, sharks and more eels inhabit coral reef environments. And coral reef environments host a numerous diversity of fish populations. And these animals want to eat the same thing. And... When they do, they have to fight for it. But if these fish populations leave due to coral reefs dying, sharks tend to also follow those fish, whereas mores stay behind. And this could result in more contact with moray eels for humans. And that's a really good look at sort of the broad scale implications of this, because like really pretty much every episode that we have ever recorded comes back to like our planet is changing how is it going to change? And so like the idea that as reefs die, waters change, we get this population migration, these shifts that we don't have a precedent for them. We don't know what's going to happen. But even answering little questions like which skin, which organism has more puncture resistant skin, that is the raw material that we can use to make our predictions of how species will interact in the future as our climate continues to change. So I love the kind of science that is these small-scale questions that are contributing to larger issues. Because I just think that a lot of attention is paid to like, oh, I am researching this large overarching question and... The reason that we're able to get any sort of answers from those large overarching questions is because we have these smaller scale studies that say, okay, well, this is a contributing factor in these types of interactions. So you have to weigh all of these factors together with that. And we wouldn't know anything if you weren't sitting there poking holes in shark skin, you know? <laughs> that's a really cool style of science, and I support that fully. I think that's one of the benefits that literally like during this conversation, I just realized this, and that's one of the benefits of being a younger scientist like especially just like us because as young as we are being able to get into research so much sooner than a lot of our peers might be able to is we get to step into this part of the scientific community that no one's really gone before like getting into like the really fine details of just our planet a changing planet very rapidly changing and so i think like you were getting at the brand of science that i think we're all in is really cool because there's things that everyone can see and realize okay that's there like it's not hard to conceptualize this but we've never stopped to think about it because it's just one of those things that we've like, I don't want to say taken for granted, but people it's just do, how you learned it. Yeah. And people are like, oh, big overarching ideals. But we have the opportunity to go in and really analyze the finer parts of our environment. Well, I think it's really cool. So. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. And what's very interesting 
I'm only about 10 years older than you guys. Y'all are probably all around 20-ish, right? 18 to 20, something like that. Okay. So I'm only about 10 years older than you guys, but in my lifetime, I have seen the shift from science talking about climate change as a problem that will happen in the future to these phenomena that we are experiencing today are a direct result of a changing climate. When I was growing up, there were occasionally wildfires out in California, but it was not wildfire season. That is a concrete change that has happened over the last almost 30 years that I've been alive. And that is a, it's sad. Obviously, that is a, a very distressing thing, but it also opens up a whole avenue of scientific study of we are no longer modeling the future. We are measuring effects. And that is a very, very different style of science that is becoming increasingly important. I have so many more questions, but I don't feel like I've gotten to know enough about you guys. So the last thing I'd like to do is just go around and hear about what you hope to do in the future with your career or your personal life, if you think you want to stay involved in this type of study, and any advice you would have for any students looking to do something similar. Um, so we can start with you, Tamara. I've really enjoyed like the REU program. It's just has opened up many opportunities for me. Um, with my career, I've always said that I want to become a biomedical scientist. It's still up in the air, just I feel like there's so much more on the horizon for me just from experiencing this research. Um, so it could be going in a different direction, but I really do enjoy the environment. I enjoy doing field work. I enjoy being in the lab and just seeing these results from everything, but also how these impacts can affect both our marine life, but also uh, humans as well. So if I can get into something like that where I can just be a better person, but also tell people about science and get them interested, then it's a win on, you know, any occasion. But something that I could tell kids today, like if they want to get into science, go for it. I'm a little bit of a nervous person sometimes. <laughs> I'm not going to joke about it or, you know, sugarcoat anything. But I was actually nervous about signing up for or applying for the RAU. But how are you supposed to know if, if you're going to get it or if you're going to do well if you just don't go for it? So I think that kids should just go out or just people in general, no matter their age, should just go and do what they want to do because there's so many opportunities and you don't know if you're going to like it if you don't try. I love it. What about you, Aubrey? Oh, man. Um, Going along with the flow of what Tamara just said, I was really nervous. I actually wasn't going to apply for the REU program because I'm actually a anthropology and biology double major with two minors, one in environmental sustainability and one in linguistics. So I am all over the place. Yes. And I didn't think that what I wanted to do, I, it was such a weird process going through and applying for this because I wasn't going to. And then um, my mentor, Dr. Allison Welch, emailed me and was like, hey, you should look into this. And I was like, no. Nah. And then he emailed me again, like the day before. I was like, how's your application going? And I was like, ah, I said apply. Uh. <laughs> Just the nervousness. Or, yeah, I was like, ah, I don't know if I'll get this, but okay, don't want to be mad at me. And I did. And he was like, great, we're doing research. And I was like, what? And it's been so much fun because I feel like as someone who wasn't like gung-ho marine biology or bust, that this wasn't going to be something for me or a summer that I was going to enjoy as much as I have. But that's the nature of getting into research. And, like, I didn't think I would say this, but, like, going out and struggling not to fall into the swamp is kind of fun. Like, it's really <laughs> exciting to, like, sit there and realize I'm standing in the middle of a swamp, like, braving mosquitoes and other animals I can't see because there's so much duck weed. Like, this is great. I'm having a ball. Are you going to face plant in the mud today? You know, let's kind of roll the not. dice. Let's I figure it out. Not. Am I going to lose a shoe? I Probably. have lost both of my shoes out there. So, um, yeah, it's I definitely agree. Badge of honor. <laughs> yeah, it really is. But it's really just listening to your gut. If you're like, you know what? If any part of you is like, I want to go for this, go. There's nothing like half of these things. It doesn't cost you anything, but some time. And I have plenty of time in between classes. I was like, yes, great time to apply. Um, it's just going for it. It really is going for it. You come into some of the best experiences ever. One of the big things that Sarah Catherine has taught me over the course of knowing her is that it's not my job to say whether or not I'm qualified to do exactly. something. Right. If I'm not sure if I'm qualified, I should apply because whoever's looking at those applications is the one who's going to know whether or not it's going to be good for yeah, me. They'll, right? they'll tell you. Yeah. They'll, yeah. Right. That's literally their job is to tell you whether or not you can make it in this program or not. Right. So it's not why should I deny myself before I even get the process going? I'm hoping because I am 
really big on culture. Like I mentioned earlier, a big part of this project was seeing how amphibians are affected because like Kermit the Frog is a big part of a lot of people's like childhoods. Like he's like, people have tattoos of this guy. Frogs and amphibians of all kinds are culturally important. And around other parts of the world, not just the U.S., but other places, there are religions and spiritualities that involve amphibians in the entire environment. And I really love understanding how culture, that's what makes us human, some would say, is our culture, how that overlaps and is intertwined so heavily with our natural environments around us. So I'm hoping to go forward doing research and conducting research, looking at how we as humans are a factor of change in the environment and then how that reflects onto us. Awesome. I love that. Okay, and then uh, Christian. So I absolutely love the research that I'm doing, and I'm so grateful for the REU program. As everyone has already said, you know, it's given me so many experiences that I would otherwise not have been able to receive. I've gotten to learn so many different techniques, learn more about, you know, sharks and more eels, more so than I ever knew before, not to mention all, all the great people that I've gotten to meet. And I actually have plans to go to vet school to be an aquatic vet because Ooh. I'm passionate about taking care of marine animals and that's where I see myself and coming from someone from South, South Carolina you know I was not really exposed to marine environments um, you know besides the occasional trip to Myrtle Beach or more notably a uh, trip I took in the seventh grade to the South Carolina Aquarium uh, where we helped release a sea turtle you know, not being able to go to the beach every day, not being able to go to the aquarium every day um, led me to watching documentaries, watching shows, reading more materials and like just really feeding into my curiosity, which then just spiraled into a passion that I'm you know, still pursuing to this day. So for those wanting to get into science who don't feel as though they have the means of doing, I say follow your curiosity and let that lead into a passion that you'll enjoy for the rest of your life. I totally agree with that. It all boils down to passion and loving it because when you love it, it doesn't matter that your whole day is about counting snails. It doesn't matter that your whole day is about trying to make sure duckweed is not living in your hair for the rest of your <laughs> life. Gosh, it wakes me up at night. <laughs> right? Exactly. When you love what you're doing, it's okay that it's hard work. When you don't love it, even easy jobs are unbearable. That's really, really excellent advice. Well, guys, I have had such a great time talking with you. This has been a great episode, and I really, I sincerely cannot wait to see where you guys go with your careers. Yes, we wish you guys the best of luck on this journey, and we know you'll do great things. Thanks for being on the show. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.